Push the start button. Okay. It's official. Stop. It's official. Hi, Scott. I'm, Hi. I'm gonna just be a little bit of a geek and um, I'm freaking out over getting to talk to you on Zoom like this. I first saw your work at Art Prize a few years ago when you were at the Grand Rapids Art Museum. And I was wandering around and saw these signs and I was like, wait, that's not a normal sign. That's a, oh, it's art, you know? And so, and I've just been kind of following you along ever since. And so I wanna buy a piece today and talk to you about which piece I should get. And um, awesome. it's my retirement present to myself. <laughs> oh, nice. That's so I, re I retired from teaching and I'm officially a full-time artist as of last week, so. And were you teaching being, art? I was teaching art, elementary art. To what age? Uh, elementary. Awesome. Elementary, little ones. And um, nice. I'm getting my graduate degree from SCAD right now. So in their okay. online programming. And so I'm gonna do the rest next semester full-time. I did this summer full time, and then one more class, and I'm a legitimate artist. That's exciting. Artist. Yeah. So. <laughs> You're a legitimate artist. <laughs> At least the piece of paper says so, you know. <laughs> right. So anyway, I don't actually I, have one of those. You don't. No, that's okay. I don't have I, a piece of paper. You know, but you're you're legitimate without one. That's even better. <laughs> well, yeah. Remains to be seen whether I'll be <laughs> right how legitimate. I'll be afterwards. Um, but I, I was actually an art school dropout. Oh, um, I, yeah, <laughs> I, uh, I, I, um, originally I went to college to study uh, aeronautical engineering at uh, the University of Colorado in Boulder. And cool. after a year of that, I discovered that that wasn't really my thing. I, I had a talent for it, but I didn't have a desire for it. And um, so then I uh, took some time off and just went back and went back, lived with my parents for a year and, you know, got a job and figured it out. And then I went back to school um, and thought, okay, I'm going to, study art because I like art and I remember being in a drawing class specifically and there was a woman at the desk next to me and she was just so much better than I was and I was like I'll never I'm never gonna be that good I'm never gonna be that good and so I dropped out of art school I ended up getting my degree in um, linguistic theory from Syracuse um, so, uh, kind of postmodern deconstruction um, and uh, literary deconstruction, uh, film deconstruction, just deconstruction in general. And um, uh, moved to Los Angeles to work in the film business. Okay. And I worked in the film business for um, for a long time. Still, I still do. I still um, help friends out and do some stuff. But I worked on big movies and TV shows and commercials, uh, doing mostly lighting and um, on-set engineering, because I had that background in engineering, so I would engineer uh, structures and things like that. Um, yeah. In 2004, I went to Burning Man for the first time. And that, um, my skill set in um, like rapid engineering from my background in engineering, but also from the film business, uh, was a real benefit to being out there because it's very windy, it's very harsh environment. And so I would build structures out there and then I would help other friends, you know, build their structures because they might have an idea, but they wouldn't know how to get it to stand up in the wind and things like that. And um, I did that for years. I started that in 2004 and I did that for years. There, there were years, probably in the like the 2006, 2007, 2008 kind of range that Burning Man was kind of my every day of the year. I was either packing up from last year or building something for the next year. So there was a, just a cycle there. And that really um, re-energized my creative side. Um, Burning Man is a, um, some people who go to Burning Man call it a permission engine. That it uh, gives you the permission to do things that you wouldn't uh, feel like you had the permission to do in what we call the default world. And um, I just started building whatever I wanted and doing whatever I wanted. And it kind of takes off all the, the cultural uh, chains. And it was really out of that, um, that uh, and th there's an element of this thing called the Cacophony Society, which has to do with, um, that's what Burning Man comes out of, 
is okay. this thing called Cacophony Society. And Cacophony Society was about um, culture jamming, kind of uh, taking things that, you know, we thought were normal cultural um, concepts and deconstructing them and kind of reappropriating them. And um, so I did a lot of that uh, in Los Angeles. There was a thing called SantaCon. So we all dress up like Santa Claus. Like, and they do it in New York. They do it all over the country. So like, you know, a couple hundred of us would dress up like Santa Claus and just go to a mall and start chanting, you know, singing songs about buying stuff and, you know, consumerism. And, you know, so that, that was the kind of culture jamming thing. So that, you know, Burning Man and Cacophony kind of fed into this, um, you know, this world that I was now getting into of being a street artist. And, you know, because the genius of street art is that you don't need to have a piece of paper that says yeah. you're an artist. Uh, you don't need to have a, a gallery. You don't have to have anything. You just walk out the door and you go, oh, well, I think this will be my canvas. And you just take it. Um, and so, you know, street art was really a, you know, th that was the only option for me. And so I was doing wheat pastes and paste up stuff and um, mostly about my cat. And, um, and then I was doing stickers and I would do these stickers or I would take like my cat's head and I would make a sticker that would fit on the, like the crosswalk guy, like the yellow diamond with the, the person crossing. And I would, or, or the, um, there's like a, a woman with a child crossing to show like a oh, yeah. school crossing. So like I would take those signs and I would put my cat's head on the dot that was the head. And so I built all the, this equipment so that I could clean off the sign because they're really high. Like street signs, two things about street signs. They're a lot bigger than you think they are and they're a lot higher than you think they are. So I had to get this sticker like 10 feet up in the air and I need to clean the surface of the sign off so the sticker would stick. Do you have yeah. any of the and, cat stickers still? Are they oh on? yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah. Oh yeah, oh, th that, does, that never goes away. So, um, <laughs> So, well, here, this is, so this was like. Oh, okay. So like, that's, that's my cat and I would do them in different kind of forms. So I had, you know, that kind of thing. Oh, but this isn't a, it, that's, so that's just his head. Okay. So it'd be that kind of sticker, but a much bigger one. Um, is these are ones that still I like. around? Is no, it the same cat now? Yeah, no, I've, other cats, but like, this is one that was really popular. He's cute. So this is. Yeah. That's me at a wedding, drinking a beer and with my cat's head on it. So, so it was it was that for you know a while, and then um, I was also doing. Um, I was thinking about okay, how can I, how can I have some actual meaning, right? Because yeah, the the cat's cute, and it's something I believe in, and I think it's fun. But you know, there wasn't really a form of like you know, there's a discovery that there's a certain amount of power that you're distributing a message. And, you know, so what message am I distributing? And by putting the cat up, I'm just kind of doing this playful undermining of street signs. But, um, you know, there's a realization of, oh, I could actually find some sort of intent in this and try and create, you know, some sort of some sort of message and some sort of um, direction with it. And at the time, I was really interested in uh, Haitian voodoo. Oh, really? And so I had this thought process of taking um, a voodoo character, a voodoo um, loa spirit that I was really interested in, um, that I was kind of doing um, a lot of work at Burning Man. I would do um, ceremonies at Burning Man, things like that. So it's very interesting in this whole concept. And so I made this character, who's this voodoo loa uh, named Baron Sambi. And so I, I had my invocation for him. And so I would take this, and then I started putting this on those signs. And because I was really trying to create this particular kind of energy. And there was a particular sign that I always wanted to put that sticker on that is of, um, it happens in San Diego, and it's um, a uh, family running across the freeway. And so it's a warning sign that families run across the freeway because they'll be coming for, for, from Mexico. Wow. And so it's a sign that's like the crosswalk person, but it's a, it's a family running. And to, to warn you, be aware, people could be running across the freeway. And I was like, oh, wow, that would be a really powerful one to kind of put my my sticker on but i i would mock up all of these things ahead of time to make sure that they looked the way i wanted them to look 
and I couldn't, I wasn't going to necessarily get down to San Diego. So I actually made a sticker oh. of the, the sign yeah. with my stickers on it. So this was kind of a big breakthrough for me was the, the concept of making a sticker of a sign. So then I started making stickers of other signs. And so, you know, this yeah. was the big breakthrough was, okay, hey, if I can make a sticker of a sign, I can make it do whatever I want it to do. I don't have to just take a pre-existing sign and put my stuff on it. I can start from scratch. And what would I want to do? It's like, well, street signs are typically negative. No left turn, wrong way, do not enter. It's all negative language. So my thought process was, okay, if I am going to deconstruct this and undermine it, I'm going to replace it with positive constructive language rather than negative destructive language. And what would that look like? What would a sign look like instead of saying stop? What no would be something? <laughs> yeah. yeah. What would be something constructive to say? So this was one of my first ones was uh, relax and breathe. These were the two first ones, the stickers I did. And I was started putting those stickers up. And then at one point, it occurred to me that, you know, I could actually make sign. And so I did the research on what the Department of Transportation specs are for signs. And I discovered that you don't have to be certified to make the signs. As long as you follow the guidelines, you're now creating an actual sign. You can make a legitimate sign if you just follow what the Department of Transportation guidelines are. So I fabricated an actual sign, the right size, the right fonts, all the right materials, the right hardware that it mounts with. And I put it up at, I don't know how well you can see that, but that's 4th and Beaudry, downtown yeah. LA. Was that the first one that you put up? That's the first one I ever did. And I did that illegally. And it was up for about six months before something happened to it. And I don't know who took it down or why, or if it was the city or what. And um, yeah, so that was an illegal installation that I did. That was like, but that was my breakthrough. It was, oh, I can do this. Um, about uh, a couple months after I did that, I saw a, um, a grant opportunity for um, a thing in a town right next to Los Angeles, a place called Glendale. And Glendale had a grant opportunity. They said, we want to have um, unusual public art was their thing. And so I put in this proposal. I said, I'll do 20 of these signs and I'll put them around town in parks and things like that. And they loved it. And they've renewed it every year since. And so I've changed up the signs and kept doing it. But that was, that was a big breakthrough for that was now, oh, I can get paid from municipalities to put these pieces in. And it's also a breakthrough of, you know, it, I would do these large scale sculptures at Burning Man. Like, let's say I was, you know, gonna make a giant duck yeah. and put it at Burning Man. Well, to do it at Burning Man, you don't need the same kind of permits and insurance that you need. If I was gonna say, oh, I'm gonna put a giant duck in Central Park. Like if you want to put a giant duck in Central Park, it might cost you a hundred grand to make the duck, but it might cost you another hundred grand in lawyers and engineers and insurance and all of these other things and months, years to go through all the red tape. Well, by building pieces to Department of Transportation spec, they already have the engineering guidelines for all of this. And if I install them to Department of Transportation spec, I can bypass all of the insurance requirements. They already have insurance for a stop sign. So yeah. I'm just yeah. replicating that. They already know that um, this is graffiti resistant. You know, when they say, oh, well, you know, a lot of times when I'm in shows with other sculptors, they're like, okay, well, you got to make sure, you know, what, what's your method for getting graffiti off it if it gets graffiti? It's like the same method for a stop sign. It's got graffiti resistant coating on it. It's it's a stop sign. It's the same stuff. So, you know, they'll always say things like, well, got to make sure your artwork is um, able to withstand the elements. It's like, yeah, no, no it can problem. withstand the elements. Yeah. It's made. <laughs> but it, it's it so checks all the boxes. That's it's well, so smart. You know, I didn't necessarily know that that's what I was doing when I went down this road. You know, the, it, some of it's luck, some of it's planning, you know, but when I hit that seam and I saw, this is the perfect way to navigate 
um, the administrative tangle because that's an artwork, you know, that's a that's a whole art of its own is getting in front of city councils and talking to them and doing the proposals and all that. That's its own, you know, that's its own art form. Yeah. And this, yeah. this, you know, just fits it. This, you know, having this as my as my paintbrush for that art form, it's you know, it just makes it really easy. And it makes it easy for them to say yes. That's the key. Well, I love it. Oh, thank you so much for sharing the whole, like the backstory of how you kind of got where you are today. That's, that's really fun. I, we were just talking about artists who dropped out of art school and class the other day, you know, a couple, uh, one of my classmates dropped out too. So she and I were chatting about it. And she's like, yeah, I know there's a lot. And, yeah, it's going to be all right, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. But, um, oh, that's so cool. Well, oh, one of the I things I'd like to say about that, um, about the dropping out of art school is, um, you know, you know, you were talking about having a piece of paper and, you know, that the legitimacy I have as a, you know, as a professional artist that, you know, I get paid for my work and things like that. The, the real legitimacy came... I had three pieces that um, showed at the Renwick Gallery of the Smithsonian in Washington. And, and to me, there's a, a, you know, a narrative that tra traces through dropping out of art school because I didn't feel like I could draw well enough to be an artist through to having pieces shown at the Smithsonian. You know, that, that, that's a story arc that I think is, you know, is really um, important to, you know, to me, the, the key is, you know, ha having vision and, and having uh, desire, you know, and so you want to pick something that's really going to speak to yourself and, you know, want you to wake up in the morning and do it. Yeah. And if you've got that, and if you can find something that's really resonates, you know, for me, you know, it, it has to really resonate with my own spirit and with my own, you know, vision of myself. And if I find that really clearly, I find that that resonates with other people. Right. That the pieces that I do that, I mean, the one behind me, you are inspiring. I've got, uh, based on a whole series of do not enter signs that, um, that all came from this one piece. I was in my shop one day and I got a phone call and this person called me because they wanted some help with this project of theirs. And I was talking them through it and I couldn't give them the help they needed. And at the end of the phone conversation, I got off the phone with them and I was just sitting down in my shop and I felt just so drained and bad. I felt like, you know, I should have been able to, to do something for them. And I thought about it and I was like, I, I'm, if I could, I would have. And I've got a really wide skill set. And if there, it's not something that I could help with, I mean, I don't know who is going to help this person because, I, you know, I, I can build just about anything or whatever. And I had to come to terms with, you know, what was the emotion I was feeling? And the emotion I was feeling was that um, I was lacking, that, you know, somehow there was a lack that I had. And so I, said, I thought to myself, I was like, well, what is it that I need to say to myself and I was like I'm enough I'm enough as I am and that sentence as soon as I said it I'm enough I was like you are enough I was like that's a piece and within 10 minutes you know I yeah. made yeah. A, you know that piece I was like and that's turned into this whole series of all these you are all sorts of different things but that you are enough that's you know that's not just a piece of artwork you know that's a that's, you know, that's me. That's me telling myself that. And, you know, finding a message that I know I need to hear, when I find a message that I know I need to hear, then other people sometimes are going to resonate with that. But, you know, that's, that to me is the goal is finding the messages that, you know, that resonate with myself. That's, that's just, I'm geeking out a little bit or getting to talk to you about all this stuff it's so cool awesome. i'm just yeah i i've loved your signs and i've wanted to get one and so 
Now you got to help me pick out which one <laughs> I can get. Uh, <laughs> oh, it's tough. I, well, I just got so back. A, I just got. Um, I just got back a prototype from a collector. Um, because sometimes, uh, you know, a collector will want to see uh, a concept, and then we'll go back and we'll refine it, and we'll kind of keep pushing it forward. So. Um, I did a prototype for a collector and put it in her house and she lived with it for, you know, a couple of months and we went back and revisited and figured out, you know, how we can make it even better. And so I dropped off the revised piece, but that means I got the prototype back. So this is the prototype I just got back, which is, you're okay. It's a, it's a mirrored piece. Yeah. Oh, that's it's cool. A, it looks like a, you know, an interstate highway kind of piece, but, uh, yeah, so that that's when I I just got back, so it's still sitting on my table. But those those are um, those are fun. That's another you know the, the work keeps kind of you know moving into new materials and things like that. I think those mirrored ones are cool. The um, the one I saw. What's the one on the wall behind you? If they're about pink, oh, what is that one? Yeah. So this is um. So this is, so it's a poem by uh, Lao Tzu, who's a Chinese philosopher. Oh. So there's peace in the world, there must be peace in the nations. There's to be peace in the nations, there must be peace in the cities. There's to be peace in the cities, there must be peace between neighbors. If there's to be peace between neighbors, there must be peace in the home. And if there's to be peace in the home, there must be peace in the heart. And so it's you know, how to achieve world peace. And the way to achieve world peace starts with finding peace in your own yeah. heart. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. so good. That's, that's a fun one. Um, I think I've done another couple of variations on that one um, with some other poems, but that's, I think that's, yeah, that one here. That's, that's my favorite. And that's one that, um, so I've taken that one, um, right, because it's about, you know, it's a, it's this notion of layers, right, that, that um, you know, there's a, there's a concept in alchemy that says, um, as above, so below, and it's this notion of kind of the, the linking between the microcosm and the macrocosm, and that, you know, one could think about, you know, the health of your cells is the health of the whole body and the health of the whole body is the health of the whole community and the health of the community is the health of the planet you know that it's it's this whole you know all the all the layers so to me this by stacking these vertically you know it's this notion of this this as above so below and this this vertical concept and so what i did was i took this same poem and i translated it into different languages and i put a whole series of these up that is kind of the horizontal version of that. So you've got the vertical version of, you know, the interconnectedness. And then by translating them into different languages, you get this matrix of the exact same saying in different languages. So you get a horizontal element to it. Think, I mean, here's like, what do we got here? This is okay, so like, this is a stack. That's a stack of that one. You can see there's a stack of them in, oh, that's in Arabic. So cool. Where did you have it installed? Did you have Say it that again? Where did you have that one installed? I installed that at a um, a show called uh, the Superfine Art Fair. So they, um, yeah, they gave me they give me a space there to do um, to do whatever I want. And so my installation there was um, that. So I had eight different languages. And then um, at the end of all of those was a, it's larger than this, but I have a model of it here, here. It was, at the end of it was a, um, one of the mirrored pieces that was a puzzle piece. Oh. It's a puzzle piece and it says, if you can read it, it says completely <laughs> And so it was um, much larger than this. This is just a model. So it was this large mirror. So then you would see, you know, you'd walk down this 
kind of corridor with the signs on either side. And then at the end of that corridor was this mirrored puzzle piece that says complete yourself. And so it's kind of the same notion that the, you know, the path to world peace is about completing yourself and starting with that and that one puzzle piece. And then you can build on that, but you have to start with that one puzzle piece that, that drives those forward. But so then these translations, you know, have, you know, they resonated with different people. So for instance, I've got one in Hebrew that, um, that uh, somebody recently bought and I installed at their house. Um, I've done it in Spanish. And then the Spanish version um, I actually installed in a um, predominantly Spanish speaking neighborhood in Los Angeles. And there's, which, you know, has an interesting component to it because um, it's a, you know, it's a US government sign and for me to put a U.S. government sign in Spanish um, is kind of a, there's a, you know, validation. There's a being seen that goes with that. So not only is it this poem about world peace, but it's in Spanish in the, the font and colors and forms of, you know, governmental control. You know, that's, you know, that's what street signs are. They're government coercion. They're, you know, they're the, the leading edge of government coercion. And to, you know, replace what, you know, a native Spanish speaker, you know, is used to seeing of, you know, American coercion with um, inspiration in Spanish. You know, that's, you know, so it kind of worked on levels that I didn't even, you know, I didn't imagine that, you know, I was just like, oh, I'm going to translate it in other languages. And then it's like, oh, these other things start coming out of it you know, once you kind of are with it for a little while. Yeah, what you're saying is very inspiring. <laughs> those little, you know, you take those little threads and they, they take you to this whole other place sometimes that you might not have expected. And, you know, like the sticker on the cat turned into these like very inspiring things by following that thread, so. Well, and never, um, never putting too much pressure. I think that, you know, there's a notion of like playfulness, you know, mm -hmm. never putting too much pressure on any of it. And knowing that, you know, you're, what you're seeing is you're just seeing, I'm just showing you a bunch of successes, you know, like you don't see the garbage cans full of stupidity, you know, that it's, you know, that's, and but at the time you know i don't i don't know which is which and then sometimes you know i'll go back to one of the stupid ones and see an angle on it that's like oh that was kind of interesting then or i'll spend months working on something and go yeah this didn't really go anywhere you know i mean i think that's another important part of it is um not be putting so much pressure on any of the work that you know that it just like kind of let it be and let it be what it's going to be and you know, follow your spirit in it. And it's like, oh, if I, if I want to keep refining this thing, I'm going to keep refining it. Even if it, I don't think it's going to go anywhere, I'm going to just keep refining it. And then it's like, ah, it didn't go anywhere. Or, hey, that's pretty cool. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. That is, it's something we all have to remember as we're going through this, you know, like not every painting I make is going to be something I want to keep or show or you know at the time I might love it but then later on I might not you know that that's just such an interesting part of being an artist you know when you don't know what will necessarily resonate with someone else and you know I think you know it's interesting because I think some of some of my work that I think is my best work and eh, nobody really cares for you know, would you show me one of the things that you think that is your and like other you, it hasn't seemed to catch or no, uh, you don't have to if you don't want to. Well, no, I mean, it's okay. Like, I mean, I just showed That's you that puzzle piece. Oh, no, 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 no. But, well, see, this is the other thing is, uh, I think there's, there's an important distinction. Okay, when you're doing a painting, you've got this framework for what a painting is that pre exists. Right, you've got a canvas, you've got, um, you know, it's, it's on stretchers, it, you know, might be framed, it hangs on a wall. It's, there's a, there's a, a history to that, there's a structure to that, there's a comprehension with your viewer of what that framework is. When, when I'm doing a piece, you know, a lot of it just has to come out of, 
it, it doesn't have any framework to it. So I can give you a great example is here's a piece right here. This oh. it's a it's a oh. giant mirrored infinity symbol. Right? Yeah. So like yeah. that's not really a piece of artwork yet. I don't know what it is. You know, it's it it's not a painting. You know, no matter what no matter what one does with paint on a canvas, it still falls under the framework of a painting that you can hang on a wall and you already comprehend how it's going to operate. But like these puzzle pieces, you know, when I first did these, I, I had, you know, I didn't know to put these brackets on them. Oh. And uh, it's like, oh, a wall hanging. It can be hung on a wall. When I first made it, I just had these random pieces and I still have these random pieces. Like here's just some, you know, a cut different sizes of them. I was like, oh, I don't know what size I'm going to like. So I did them in a bunch of different sizes and I did the text in different sizes. You know, so like these are, there's a whole pile here of, you know, really small ones. Yeah. You know, and then there's these really small little infinity logos. And I'm like, I don't know what this is. I just kind of think this is neat. So I'm going to cut these out. And, um, I did this this piece you can you can barely tell, but it's um let's see here. So this is a bunch of letters. Right? So it's a letter C. That's a whole stack. And that stack of letters spells out uh the phrase created equal. Oh, cool. Ah. It spells it out in the font that um Benjamin Franklin used in his printing press. So that would be the way the words created equal would appear at the time they were written if they did. And so I've been, I thought a lot about the, you know, the, the concept of that sentence, you know, it's one of the most, you know, famous sentences in, you know, certainly in American history. Um, but we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Well, I think what's, what's interesting about that sentence is we can agree on those two words created equal. What we have a lot of trouble with, and this is because of the way the country was formed, so we have a lot of trouble with the word men. So when we say all men are created equal, the word men is really problematic. And it's not just because it's men and it doesn't talk about women. It's what was the definition of men at the time the Declaration of Independence was written. And, you know, you have the French Revolution and you have, a, you know, there's a whole lot about, you know, the rights of, of, of man you know, that, were, that were spreading at that time. And so it's a really fertile ground for what is freedom and what is individuality and who deserves this notion of being created equal. And by virtue of looking at what the Constitution said, Specifically, all, all men, oh, hang on. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Did I go away there for a second? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I got a phone call. Um, all men are created equal. The Constitution laid out who men were, and according to the Constitution, that was white Christian landowning men. That was not women. That was not non-whites. That was not non-Christians. And that was not even white men who didn't, own property. So white Christian property holding men is what all men are created equal meant when it was written. And that's gone through some changes over time. And so now we have a slightly different perspective of that. Some people, some people have that same perspective of, of what it meant then that it should still mean that. So it's a, it's a tricky it's a tricky concept equal is something i think we can all agree on what the word men means in that sentence all men are created equal is much more complex and so i took the words created equal and made them into mirror to reflect us to see us reflected back and i've done some proposals where those letters are you know much bigger like 3 feet tall and um the proposal is for um 
the Eastern State uh, uh, Penitentiary. It's an old penitentiary that's become a historical landmark and shows artwork. And so my concept is to put three foot high letters in mirror that say created equal and put them in successive cells oh. next to each other. So, you know, that's, that's an example of, you know, right now it's a pile of letters sitting on my floor <laughs> and, it's, and it's a proposal, it's a piece of paper with some ideas written about it. So, you know, there's all sorts of, you know, different directions. And so that's a piece that, you know, I feel really strongly about and I feel really strongly about the narrative and things like that, but it's, it's not even a piece of artwork. It's, it's a, it's a proposal and some, it's some you know, bits and pieces. Yeah. But like the other artwork I do is when I was showing you the infinity symbol, Yeah, I do this work with, uh, I have a, I built a printing press that runs on gunpowder. And so. Website. That's so kind of crazy. Did you do yeah. that Burning Man too? Or no? No. So that was, um, so I'm an ordained minister. Oh. And so I do, uh, I do weddings um, just for my friends. Like I don't do it as a, as a job, but um, some of my friends had a, um, they wanted me to preside over their wedding and they're voodoo practitioners, you know, I was telling, talking about voodoo previously, and um, they wanted to incorporate their, the symbol for their voodoo spirit into the wedding. And um, the, their particular voodoo spirit, one of the materials that their voodoo spirit uh, is invoked by is gunpowder. And so I had this thought of um, doing some sort of thing of creating their uh, Loa's uh, sigil, the the sign for um, it's called a veve, which is like the symbol that invokes the spirit. It's going to do the veve out of gunpowder. <clears throat> and I thought, oh, I'll do it like the Bugs Bunny kind of thing, where you put it down all the gunpowder, and then you light one end of it, and it'll burn onto like a piece of wood or a piece of paper, and then I'll have the symbol after the gunpowder's burned. Like, how neat will that be? Yeah, that doesn't work. Um, so <laughs> and Bugs Bunny, right? Or <laughs> it only works in Bugs Bunny, and probably only works with like old gunpowder. Now you've got this new gunpowder that goes into bullets that's safer, smokeless, and it doesn't operate that way. So I went through a whole bunch of different iterations, and eventually came up with this concept of oh, the way contemporary gunpowder detonates is when it's under pressure. So I took a piece of wood and I carved the design into the wood and I packed that carving with gunpowder. And then I took a canvas and pressed it down into there. And it was under that pressure that I could get it to detonate. And, that's, and I had created a gunpowder printing press. And so I took that process and it, there's like a moment in the wedding which is the like, you know, the two souls become one. You know, some people take two candles and light one candle or they'll pour two different colored sand into a vase or things like that. Mm -hmm. So for that moment, I had each of them, they had a, um, a, a fire and touched each side of the gunpowder and we detonated it. And so then I could say, and I held it up over them and said, you know, by the power vested in me in the eyes of Papa Legba, you know, I now pronounce you man and wife. So that moment that they were joined is captured by that explosion in the canvas. And so I did it just for the wedding, but I was like, oh, this is kind of a cool concept. And so I, I kind of refined the printing press part of it and made an actual machine that was that I could get replicated, you know, like a, like a silk screen kind of machine or like a printing press. And um, I also discovered in the process that there are, a lot of different kinds of gunpowder. So you can picture me that first time walking into um, like a gun store and saying, hi, I'd like to buy some gunpowder. And the woman behind the counter is, okay, what kind? And I look up and I realize that there are like 200 different jars, you know, behind her. And I'm like, oh yeah, I'll take that one. She's like, oh, RX-232, sure. And I'm like, yeah, RX-232, like, I'm not a terrorist. I'm. <laughs> I don't know what I'm just in here buying gunpowder that I know art. nothing about. <laughs> but after that process, I discovered, oh, every kind of bullet has its own kind of gunpowder. And so going through this process of discovery, I started thinking about 
you know, and they all have different characteristics. They're all very different. Rifle bullet gunpowder is very different than handgun bullet gunpowder as opposed to shotgun. There are all these very different kinds of gunpowder, hundreds of different kinds. And so I started this series where I took symbology of, um, that was representational of violent, you know, moments of gun violence in American history. And I would create those symbols using the gunpowder that would go in the bullets that took place with that event. So, you know, one of those pieces, and it's kind of wrapped right now, so it's kind of hard to see because it's in a wrapping. But so this is a sign that's, that was out in front of Sandy Hook. And so it says, that yeah, let me, that. let me see if I can, this is a sheet of glass for a different project. I saw that on your website, I think. Oh, the Sandy Hook one? Yeah. Was yeah. it at the school, actually? Well, so this sign, this, so this is a, you know, obviously just a um, representation, but this, the sign says, says Sandy Hook School in 56, oh. and it says visitors welcome. So this is the sign that hung in front of Sandy Hook, this, you know, this representation of this sign. Yeah. And so I took that design and um, using 223 assault rifle gunpowder burned this image into canvas. And so I've done a whole series of, um, you know, portraits of, oh, portraits of Martin Luther King, portraits of uh, John Lennon. Um, I did John Lennon on, uh, here's, this is the plate. So it's John Lennon's uh, self portrait. Yeah. So that's the wood with the carving in it. And then I took that design and detonated it into, his um oh. his solo album so it's oh, john lennon yeah, laying yeah. back yeah and then that's his self-portrait burned into it with the gunpowder so that was with 38 caliber handgun gunpowder so I, I went through this whole process of um you know that that's examples of other kind of stuff that you know i i feel strongly about and i think that there's a lot of good work in it but it it doesn't necessarily resonate the same way. You know, the signs are super accessible. They're, um, they're easy to produce for me. You know, they're easy to ship. They're uh, resilient to the elements. You know, they're, and they're uplifting. You know, the, the other work um, has been really beneficial for me and for my journey, but you know, nobody wants, um, the Sandy Hook piece hanging in their house. It's just not, that's just not how that works. So, you know, that, that's examples of that. I'm, I still pursue that work and I still love that work. And that show, that stuff shows, you know, museums and things like that, but it's, it's not, it's not the same kind of stuff that, you know, I don't get gallerists begging me. Out of it. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, gallerists aren't saying, Oh yeah, we can sell a bunch of this. Yeah. You know, but it is, like you said, it is really important work. And so it's important to follow those threads because it communicates something that needs to be communicated. So you totally. know, I feel like those little threads that take us in these different directions. And that's an interesting story of how that the gunpowder work started, you know, because you were asked oh, yeah. to do something. You were like, I'm asked to do this. So, oh, now I'm curious about what all this how it all works. I have just chasing strange, down those threads. I have this, this strange affection for these gnomes that somebody somebody left one of those like uh, you want to see my gnome. I mean, and I don't know why. I have no clue right? why. But like, right. I want to make all these gnomes. That's awesome. So someone left one of these. I had a studio for I mean like a gallery for a year and then closed it because I decided I didn't want to do that. But um. And so they left this gnome and like we drew right. it in the drawing class. He was so funky. But now I've started like making my own little oh, ceramic yeah. gnomes. She's a little, I found her a little mold, you know. I don't know why. Awesome. I got a yeah. lot to do. Why am I doing that? I don't know. <laughs> totally. We'll see where it goes. <laughs> Boy, I got a lot gotta, to do. Why am I doing that? Exactly. <laughs> I've got to write a thesis paper by next week. Finish that up, you know. <laughs> exactly. Oh <laughs> my God. So many little, things. I'd rather make this little girl gnome out of clay. We'll see yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. 
So it's been so cool listening to your story. I'm going to stop the recording here and we can talk about which one I'm going to get, if that's okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's so cool. You're amazing. Aw. I'm just, that's I'm fun. totally inspired by like what you're saying and what you're doing. It's just Aww. super cool. Oh, I love Thank that. you so much for taking time to talk to me. It's like amazing. No. I'm I'm gonna so much fun. get all the Clempton stuff. Seriously, because your yeah. songs are so inspiring. Um, but I get I have my budget. <laughs> I told you yeah. five hundred dollars. And I love the ones that the little ones that stand up. Do you have one oh, that yeah. I, like on a little stand? So I do I do like uh you know, so that's a, like a like a thirty inch is that, how, is, is that how big it is? Yeah. Um, I mean, this, these are the ones that I do on little stands. So like as an example, it's it'd be something, you know. Yeah. So it's a little lower than that. So it's somewhere around like. I love it. Can I get one, something like that? Yeah, um, of course. And I don't really you know, know what, what, what should the sign say. Oh, well. <laughs> Because I, mean, I saw there was one, the one thing that led me to like reach out to you instead of just buy it off your website, which is, was, I was like, I should just do that and stop bugging you. But I was <laughs> <laughs> so excited to, that you were willing to talk to me. So I, um, I like the one that stands up and, but I didn't know if you had other signs that you could put on the front of it or which one. Like, so here's the thing, every sign I do, I can do at any scale. Okay. So um, any any of them, you know that that you know that you resonate with, I can do as a. I call that a, that's a twelve inch, right? So that that one you just saw is you know twelve inch square, but yeah. you know like so I can do any piece as a twelve inch, and then that is you know kind of the appropriate size to go on okay what i that, that, i call that a tabletop yeah so and that, the tabletop stand is generic and any sign i do i can do as a 12 inch so you know that's that's not um you know, <laughs> I, I have literally like hundreds so it's um i mean what, I like what like were the ones in that, a candy store i don't know <laughs> well what what kind of hired you what kind of motivated you in the first place like what are the I just, I liked how positive they all were. And I love the spin on the neck, you know, like taking a do not enter and flipping it into like, you know, you are awesome or what, you know, I mean, I, I just like that, that flip on the, on the negative into the positive. And, um, well, for me that, that, like I said, the, the do not enter one, the one that's to me is the gateway to all of them is that you are enough. Yeah, and that's I mean, probably the that, one I need to hear the most these days, because like... <laughs> that's the one I need the most. Mm. I mean, that's that's the one that, um, you know, I've gone through a whole lot of different, you know, language with that. But really, you know, to me, none of them ever, you know, there's, it's it's funny because I think it's the, it's not necessarily the one that's like the, you know, flashiest or exciting, like, because I do a lot of pieces at like other festivals and stuff. So that like, it'll be a music festival and I'll put up a whole bunch of pieces there. And everybody wants to like take a picture of themselves with the like, you are amazing, you know, which is great. You know, I'm, it's not that I don't like that one. Or, um, you know, as the kids say today, the kids use the word fire as a, um, as like uh, an adjective. So they'll say, you are fire. That is fire. Not like on fire or something like that. They'll just say, like as a noun that oh that's fire if they really like something like is the way i would say awesome they say fire and so i've got a sign that says you are fire and the kids love it at the music festivals they love getting their picture taken with that um or you are magic you know so you know those are all you know and to me the all of them but there's something um I don't know, you know, that, that resonates at a deeper level that you are enough, 
because it's it's not flashy it's almost like to me it's like more soulful like oh yeah like it you know it's it's not a party so much you I know think that's probably the one i should get because when you said it it made me like a little McClempt. <laughs> that's what i mean is it the you you are amazing or something like that makes you kind of you know and it's it's happy and it, which is great and that's not a that's not a bad thing but like you are enough there's like a, a settling down that happens with it there's like a grounding that happens with it it's like to me there's a um you know it just has it has a, a it's almost like um you know like uh e eating something healthy versus like a candy bar you know candy <laughs> bars are great but it's like if you can have like a really tasty salad <laughs> that you know that's yeah. delicious and you know and is really good for you and like you know you know not that i want to compare my artwork to a salad it should all be candy bars <laughs> it should all be ice cream no but i think the salad is sustainable you know like it's what sustains yep. us anyway so totally totally okay i think so, I, yeah I, I like that you are enough one i think you want to do that i would love to do that yeah okay so okay. um email me your address okay and then and, how do you, uh, you do venmo or do you sure, money sure you like venmo. okay yeah i can do venmo and yeah. so the um uh the 12 inch ones are uh 325 and then the tabletop base is 25 bucks okay so yeah. 350 and then maybe then you just have to figure out shipping but i'll okay. but send me your address and i'll figure out what shipping is okay okay that all work yeah and then um just do you want to send me your phone number so i'll then mow you the the money okay. after you let me know how much the shipping will be oh that'd be cool totally totally but do you have my email address you have my is yeah. that what we've been talking over yeah yeah so just email me your address and then i'll just you know send you back stuff when i you know I have, i'll have to make that piece so it's going to take me a couple of days do you want me to pick one that's already made no oh. no I, I, it, it's just going in the queue with other stuff you know it's it's all good okay. it's all good now well, i'll make it for you it'll be yours <laughs> and will you, you'll sign it and everything it'll be signed do you want to throw some stickers in there for me too and i will put some stickers in there i'll definitely put um some you are enough stickers in there the other thing that i'm doing a lot of lately is um every time somebody buys like a sticker or something on my store i do um oh so i made this this is, a, this is a roll yeah yeah of uh raffle tickets and so the raffle tickets so you'll get a chance the raffle ticket says one chance at life oh my God. i love it so i'll send you some stickers and some some raffle tickets with this with the sign. Oh, uh, cool. Well, here's an example. Random crap. Like I just, just thought, like, oh, this is a good idea. And like this was the original one. I got a hold of this company and they did these. And I'm like, no, they need to be red and they need to have the little divots. You know, they need to be the ticket shaped. These are just rectangular. I'm like, no. So now I've got this roll of useless raffle tickets because the right ones have to have the correct shape. Yeah. Got to have that little little divots on them. Another roll. No, I've got. I have so much stuff that just doesn't. I mean, I showed you those infinity logos. I just have so much stuff that just turns into whatever. You never know. And who knows? Maybe it'll be something in the future. Every time I see an artist who's in, like in their studio with their stuff, you know, I feel like. Oh, that's what it looks like. Okay. I feel better about my fit. You know, like, cause I got the same, I've got, but not to that capacity yet. Like I'm, I'm getting there, but. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah. Getting there. Well, and you just, you know, it is whatever it is. Cause it's only half of this is my stuff. The other half is all my wife's makeup. My wife's a makeup artist. Oh, cool. So it's like right now, right now my work table, and this is my work table. Those are all road cases. She just did a job in Romania and oh. she hasn't unpacked it yet. So this is all road cases full of makeup. So my, my work table is completely occupied with makeup right now. <laughs>
big famous artist, but no, I, I don't give the table to myself. <laughs> that's so great. That's good. Oh, that's so cool. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you chatting with me. And I'm so excited oh, about my new piece of artwork. Awesome. Cool. cool. Well, drop me an email. Okay. Talk soon. Thank you so much. Cool. Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.